So Charlemos um, uh, is an initiative uh, organized by Jennifer Sir at Ditela in Buenos Aires, Alicia Holland at Harvard, Andres Mejia Costa at King's College in London, Scott Morgenstern at Pittsburgh and Raul Sanchez Uribarri at La Trobe University in Melbourne. And, and the point of Charlemos is to have a conversation more so than a panel presentation with people who are writing exciting papers in political science and uh, related social sciences and to talk a little bit about the story behind the research, but also connect the research that they're doing to some current events. And today we have two wonderful scholars, um, uh, comparativists as well as uh, scholars who know a lot about uh, Brazil to talk to us about this incredibly important election about to take place in Brazil. So let me introduce our, uh, I, 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 my name is Javier Corrales, I teach at Amherst College, and let me introduce uh, our, 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 our guests. Um, Nara Pavão is assistant professor in the political science department at the Federal University of Pernambuco in Recife, Brazil, um, and she has a PhD in political science from Notre Dame and has also been a visiting uh, uh, researcher at Vanderbilt. Um, Nara has written and is working on uh, political behavior and specifically questions pertaining to public opinion, corruption, fake news, and uh, judicial affairs, and a bunch of other topics. We have highlighted one recent paper from her that uh, to discuss today, although she has many topics that she covers. Uh, that paper is called Corruption as the Only Option, The Limits to Electoral Accountability, published in the Journal of Politics in July 2018. Welcome, Nara. It's a pleasure to have you. With Nara, we also have Bob Kaufman. Uh, Bob is a distinguished professor of political science at Rutgers University. Uh, he holds a PhD in government from Harvard University. And I have to say, um, uh, Bob Kaufman has been writing or co-writing or co-editing books, basically addressing some of the most central issues affecting the region uh, almost every decade. Um, in, uh, uh, he, he, um, uh, the titles of some of his books, they're all uh, uh, incredibly famous. The Politics of Adjustment, The Political Economy of Democratic Transitions, Reforming the State, another book on uh, reforming uh, uh, welfare politics in Latin America, Crucial Needs and Weak Incentives, um, uh, another book on uh, um, the welfare state entitled Development, Democracy, and Welfare States in Latin America and East Asia and Eastern Europe. Um, more recently, Dictators and Democrats, Elites, Masses, and Regime Change. And for today, we picked his latest, his latest publica publication from Cambridge Elements about nothing other than democratic backsliding. He doesn't want me to say this, but he's a good expert on Brazil. So this is a, a wonderful thing uh, to have him here uh, talk about the election. So um, welcome, Bob. Welcome, Nara. And why don't we start uh, by let's do um, an assessment of regime dynamics under Bolsonaro, and especially from the point of view of democratic backsliding. Democratic back backsliding defined as uh, an, uh, an elected president trying to assault the institutions of checks and balances and degrading political rights. So with democratic backsliding, we talk about degrees of backsliding. I'm curious about each of your assessments of how far Bolsonaro has gone, if any. What have been the institutions that he has been able to weaken? Which institutions have resisted? Your assessment, and you can talk about Brazil or you can talk comparatively. So maybe we'll go with Nara, why don't you start? 
Um, thank you, Javier. And thank, um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about my work, but um, most importantly about this exciting elections. Um, so uh, for the first time, we have like a president after the dictatorship, right? That uh, openly praises the dictatorship and is openly against um, democracy. So I think that this is uh, an important sign that uh, we have um, democratic backslash in the sense that we have someone um, elected um, for president that is constantly um, with this anti-democratic discourse, but also constantly attacking institutions. And to answer your question more precisely, he is attacking mostly like three institutions. So he's attacking um, judicial institutions. There are also the institutions that are trying to regulate his behavior and to limit his, his behavior and to make sure that he's um, um, you know, acting uh, uh, in accordance to the constitution and to the rules of procedures and to what is expected of a president. But he's also attacking um, um, electoral institutions, more specifically, he's attacking um, the voting system in, of, the, of the country. So he's basically uh, claiming that um, he's, he's, he's basically att attacking the integrity, right, of electoral institutions, saying that um, we should not rely in the election results, right, that there is fraud, that elections are rigged, but he provides no evidence uh, of that. And finally, he's attacking the media. Uh, and so I would say that these are the three main institutions that he has been attacking, judicial institutions, uh, electoral institutions, and the, the media, right? And in a country in which these institutions are, are weak and democracies uh, recent and um, which, you know, uh, Brazil has um, uh, went through so many political crises and a period, a long period of political instability. So I think that that's why it's so dangerous to have a president that it's uh, going openly against this, these institutions. Thank you, Nara. And Bob, um, from a comparative perspective, um, what do you make of the Brazilian case? Uh, should we be alarmed or are you feeling like the institutions are holding up? Um, what's your sense uh, um, uh, of, of where this process uh, is at the moment? Well, I think we should be alarmed. Um, things are, uh, are not, have not gone well and there are attacks on institutions. I thought it might be useful uh, preparing for the uh, this conversation uh, to put together a slide uh, that puts uh, Brazil in some comparative perspective. So I, I don't know who's controlling the slides, but if you can um, put this up. I think, Manuel, do you have the slide? Uh, um, well, there we go. There we go, yeah. So, uh, you know, I hope this gives some perspective on this. So this is uh, from uh, the VDEM data set that I'm sure most of the people on this, uh, on this and Charlamos is familiar with. Uh, it's a massive project that uh, surveys, has expert judgments on multiple countries. And one of the key things that they look at is something they call the Liberal Democracy Index. And that's a, uh, a uh, expert judgments, it's you know subjective to some extent, but expert judgments on uh, electoral freedom, civil liberties, uh, checks and balances. Those are the main the main things. And I put together a, a, the slide that shows the uh, the course of uh, of uh, the liberal democracy index since the mid 1990s for the United States, Hungary, uh, uh, Venezuela, and Brazil. And a downward slope that you see is, is a sign of backsliding. So um, uh, what I think is interesting is that um, uh, Brazil and the United States are reasonably close to each other. Brazil looks like it's gone a little bit farther than the United States. I think that's probably wrong. I think the United States is, is at least in as much trouble. But both of those countries in turn, I think, uh, contrast pretty sharply with both Venezuela and Hungary. And Hungary, the, uh, in both of those countries, the liberal democracy index has really declined below what we would consider a threshold of democracy. And so neither of those are, are democratic at this point. 
Uh, the United States and Brazil have not. Uh, they're still above the threshold, at least by this, this measure. So uh, there's bad news and there's good news, I guess, Javier, in direct response to your question. I mean, the bad news is there's been a significant decline of liberal democracy in Brazil, at least um, by this measure. Uh, the good news is that it hasn't declined so far uh, that dem democracy has disappeared in Brazil. Yeah. So uh, in that sense, I think uh, institutions have been resilient. You can take there, there was, I mean, this is an interesting point because uh, some, some backsliding cases are very quick, other are more gradual. Um, who knows, maybe it's too early if we get another Bolsonaro term, who knows what's gonna happen. But there was an article, uh, I think you both saw it in the New York Times yesterday uh, entitled, To Defend Democracy, Is Brazil's Top Court Going Too Far? Written by Jack Nickus and Andres Pigaroyo, where they argue that the courts have survived, which is have kept their autonomy, which is remarkable in cases of democratic backsliding where the courts tend to lose their autonomy quickly. But they're perhaps going to an extreme. In order to contain Bolsonaro, they themselves have become a bit too uh, powerful. I'm wondering if you care to discuss, uh, you know, you saw this article and let's talk about the courts and the, the fight between Bolsonaro and the courts. Nara, do you want to uh, address that one? Yeah, so courts in Brazil uh, have recently been very active in politics, and this started um, more clearly with Lava Jato. There was a huge um, anti-corruption investigation, and um, courts were then playing this very active role in fighting corruption. And I guess that now courts have changed uh, their their focus, right? And they're uh, are going um, against this or trying to deal with these attacks against institutions. And it's super controversial what what they are doing, right? Because they are trying to they they are claiming that they are trying to protect democracy, uh, and they are super concerned with, for instance, fake news. In particular, fake news. They are trying to create uh, disinformation about the electoral process, uh, which is very concerning anyway. Uh, but um, so the uh, so courts are are also reacting uh, in a very uh, passionate way, I think, because uh, courts are being attacked under uh, by the government. So I think this makes uh, the Supreme Court uh, justices very angry. They are personally attacked by the government. Uh, Bolsonaristas, they, you know, they talk about specific uh, justices and they they are uh, politicizing their work all the time, so I think it's all it's 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 complicated because they are trying to protect the institution, the the, the judicial institutions. They are also trying to protect their personal and individual reputation, and they are um, going against uh, a, a political group that is very extremist too, right? So they also become extreme, and and they're also acting in this very they're uh, kind of replicating the polarization that exists in the in society and um, among the the electorate, right? But one of your key points in your uh, Cambridge Elements piece on democratic backsliding is the uh, connection between democratic backsliding and polarization. And here you have an account of polarization between institutions, not just uh, between parties. Uh, what do you make of this? Well, I think that uh, uh, I think that Nara has really hit the nail on the head in terms of in the last comment that she made, that in a polarized situation, uh, it's, uh, it's very hard to stay neutral. Uh, uh, and whether you're running an institution like the court or whether you're running a political party or whether you're in the Congress or, or some other institution. Uh, so um, polarization has an extremely corrosive effect on, on independent institutions, you know, I think for that reason. Uh, in the backsliding book, we emphasized um, the executive's uh, takeover of institutions. And fortunately, I think that hasn't happened in Brazil. Uh, it would be a very, very bad sign if either Bolsonaro or some successor were, were able to do that. Uh, but um, it's uh, even if that doesn't happen, it's very destabilizing precisely because it's hard to maintain a neutral 
uh, serious rule of law position uh, when the society is so divided. So interesting that uh, we can see not just uh, voters, but uh, institutions themselves getting caught up in this uh, uh, game. Um, let's now turn a little bit to the elections. Um, so Nara, help us understand where are we on corruption? One of the most important points you make in that uh, wonderful piece on corruption is that um, when um, corruption becomes so pervasive, it ceases, it stops being a priority for the electorate. They might start to choose other things, but it still creates opportunities for a very anti-corruption candidate to capitalize on the moment. So you wrote this in 2018. How would you update this insight to help us understand the election in Brazil now? Um, Bolsonaro with his anti-corruption stand, but uh, a lot of corruption himself and Lula himself with a uh, tarnished reputation. What's the role of corruption in this election? How, uh, how, how, how would you help us here? Okay. I mean, if I could update that piece, I would do that in so many different ways because I wrote it. I wrote a, a dissertation about corruption before Lava Jato. So when I returned to Brazil, I was just like, okay, so it's completely, the reality is completely different. Um, so I defended my dissertation in 2015, Lava Jato started in 2014, and the effects of Lava Jato were really kind of felt in 2018, uh, the electoral consequence of Lava Jato. So, but basically, I think what happens is that Lava Jato uh, raised the salience of corruption in people's minds, right? So the idea is that people were very... Uh, um, tolerating of corruption because of this perception that everybody was corrupt uh, and at the same time nothing was done about corruption right like no one was fighting corruption and basically corruption was the rule and it wasn't a, a helpful or useful criteria for choosing or selecting or differentiating among different candidates what happened is that um, at the end of the day, Lava Jato reinforced that idea, right? That whole system was corrupt. I'm very critical of the way Lava Jato worked and and and, and you know was went against corruption because it basically demonized the political system. And now, I mean, now after you know so many years, uh, uh, um, you know, ob ob observing Lava Jato, we can see how the this initiative was uh, um, problematic, right? Now we have Sergio Moro running for office. We have uh, Deltan de Lagnol running for office, uh, the two main names of Lava Jato, right? Uh, and uh, basically what, what Lava Jato did was to reinforce this idea that the system was completely corrupt and that the main solution for the system was to, to clean, to, to take politicians out, right? And basically the, the idea was like, we need new people, we need non-politicians running the country. And this just paved the way um, for someone like Bolsonaro, who was a, an insider. He had been in politics for 30 years, but he was this very obscure politician that managed to sell himself as an outsider, which was per basically what the country wanted in 2018. Right, someone who would signal uh, no connection to the political system, to this rotten, uh, inefficient political system, but someone who at the same time would, you know, uh, fight corruption. And what Bolsonaro did was very like he basically used this anti corruption um, campaign slogan, right, and which was super effective back then, right, because this is what everyone wanted to hear. And Lula was in jail. Um, and so basically, it was. It, the, the anti-corruption anti discourse really worked in 2018. But then what we saw after that is that Bolsonaro uh, faced so many corruption accusations while in office. Uh, Sergio Moro decided to join his government as uh, uh, the Minister of Justice, but then he left. And uh, basically, uh, Lava Jato is over. And Lava Jato lost uh, its credibility completely because of all the scandals that happened, because of the political intentions of the actors that uh, after a while became clear that they had electoral intentions, that they were uh, they hated the Workers' Party, for instance, and they had these personal motives to go against the, 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 the PT2. So um, I think basically, 
now corruption does not matter much. People, it's it's even less useful now than it was, for instance, in 2014 or before uh, Lava Jato, because it basically you, you cannot differentiate uh, Bolsonaro from Lula because they were both kind of uh, faced with corruption charges. And also the other candidates, right? Um, Tebet, she's from PMDB, which was super you know, involved in Lava Jato too. So it's really hard to see a viable candidate that is clean or that has not been involved in politics. So uh, people are not talking much about corruption now. It doesn't mean right. people don't care much about corruption. Are you a little surprised that there are no newcomers this time around again? Uh... You know, I mean, Mr. It, Bolsonaro, uh, rather than getting another caudillo with corruption, uh, with back, uh, baggage. Yeah, so Bolsonaro and Lula, they're just super strong. They are, you know, they're two, too big. like one former president and a president running yeah, for office. Right, never right. had that. And uh, and in 2018, we had two obscure politicians. We had Adadi, yeah. who Adadi was, and we had Bolsonaro, who was also, you know, an obscure politician. So yeah. now we have this two, uh, you know, very well known and politicians who actually governed and who were in office for a while. So I think there was no room for other politicians, but also. Uh, for a while, 40% of the population claimed that they wanted a different uh, politician or so a third uh, uh, candidate, but they would never agree on who that person would be, right? And yeah. it's too difficult, especially when you have this polarized scenario. It's interesting. Maybe you get a chance to get a newcomer maybe once in a generation. And uh, if you miss it, then you go back to the old caudillos, I guess. Um, Bob. Let me turn to you and ask you a question about um, a possible Lula government. And here we're going to uh, speculate. The polls indicate, I've seen polls that give Lula, most polls are giving Lula uh, an ample margin of victory, ranging from maybe 10, 13% to 6% uh, uh, points. Um, so it is possible that Lula will win. and. Um, one of the problems with ex-presidents coming back to office many times is that, you know, they have uh, a strong fan base, but they have a lot of detractors. And I'm wondering, in your opinion, um, what would Lula need to do to, if he becomes president, to, to manage the anti-Lula, anti-Pete sentiment, which is still out there, um, 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 do you have any 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 thoughts on this? Uh, well, I think he's already doing one important thing, which is in the selection of his running mate. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know, somebody from the old opposition party, uh, 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 they used to be bitter antagonists. Now they're they're allies, and I think that may do help at least to um, you know cool the waters in that. In that respect, I'm more worried about another feature of Lula coming back, and that is the whether the expectations uh, for Lula as president are set too high, and whether that may set him up for a big crash politically. Um, you know, we've had several instances in Latin America of second round presidents who who everybody thought would solve the problems who then crashed, including uh, one uh, in your uh, neck of the woods, uh, Javier in Venezuela, who, you know, when you had um, uh, uh, Carl Sanders Paris come back and everybody thought he would repeat the miracle of the 1970s uh, and, uh, and clearly didn't. Uh, Lula had a very positive first round of his presidency. Uh, commodity prices were very high, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, all of the sort of economic circumstances, global and local, were very favorable. Uh, and so he provided over a boom. Uh, and I think a lot of people, my guess is that a lot of people will, will remember him for that. Uh, he's coming into power uh, this time in a much, much more difficult uh, international and domestic situation. He's not going to be able to dramatically turn the economy around. Uh, 
and um, and I think he's likely to disappoint a lot of people, so uh, whose expectations were too high. So um, I'm worried uh, less about his ability to kind of calm the waters with the anti lula people than I am about him being able to uh, meet the expectations that people have for a second uh, a second lula presidency. Nara, any other worries about a uh, potential new Lula administration? Uh, anything you're thinking about? Um, no, I think I have exact the same concerns that Bob has uh, in terms of the expectations. But I also think that um, because the country is so polarized and now we know that you know, that even though partisanship tends to be lower in Brazil than it is in other countries, uh, we see that political identities are super strong. And we know that now we have petistas and bolsonaristas, right? And, and this new identity of bolsonaristas is really uh, interesting. So it's interesting to see that uh, this identity has been formed so quickly in the country and around a, a person that it's so controversial, right? And that came to office so, unexpectedly. Uh, but so I think Bolsonaro has the same problem, right, in terms of if he wins elections, which I, I don't I don't think uh, it's going to happen. But if he wins, he's going to have a hard time um, governing, too, because basically uh, his rejection rates are, you know, way uh, um, are, are much higher than Lula's, for instance. So it's 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 always hard to govern in a polarized society. Right. And I think what might happen help Lula is that some people are voting for him because they don't want Bolsonaro to win. So they might always have this, oh, it could be Bolsonaro, right? So let's just stick to this um, politician now and hope that, you know, things are going to work. But again, he's going to govern under very different conditions now. And that's concerning. Can I just uh, make one final observation? Actually, Nara is about her, your, um, comments on corruption, which I thought were really very important and very interesting. I just wonder whether um, we need to stretch out the time horizon a little bit. Uh, as I took your point, uh, you know, everybody's discussed, all sides are corrupt. Everybody discussed that there's no real anti-corruption candidate out there in the, in waiting to take power. Um, if a second, presidency of Lula is a disappointment. And particularly if there's, if it's clouded by a, a new round of corruption, I'm wondering whether that would set the stage, not tomorrow, but down the road for um, some candidate coming along and saying a curse on, on all your houses. Um, uh, the, the thing that worries me about that scenario is that the outside candidate doing that is usually an autocrat populist and an autocrat who is uh, not going to, you know, not going to improve the, the situation. But anyway, that's, uh, I just wonder whether there's a longer time horizon, which disappointment might lead to outside. Yeah, I think the disappointment of Lula government will be of a different nature. I, I, I don't, I think the government, they will be so concerned about corruption now and try to, and they will try to avoid it as much as possible. That's what Lula says. That's how he's like talking about uh, corruption now. And um, so I think, yeah, I mean, it, it, well, but so I see, see your point, yeah. Um, I have one more question to ask, but I forgot to remind those of you who are listening that you have an opportunity to ask your questions and we welcome them. I'm sorry that I didn't mention this. If you have a question, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. I hope you can find it. And um, we have somebody who's going to be monitoring this in case uh, uh, it gets too busy. We would love to be able to, to hear from you. So please take advantage of that. This is a webinar and um, I, uh, I'm, I'm ready to turn to the questions once we, we're ready. But I do have one more question following up for both of you. Okay, I'm going to press you a little bit more, if I may. Uh, in addition to the problem of um, disappointing because of heightened expectations, I do think that there is now in Brazil a consolidated far right movement that perhaps it didn't exist before. 
And from the little that I know, it seems that the two, the three elements in this movement, I'm gonna call it the Brazilian MAGA, um, involves uh, elements of the military, maybe, elements of the corporate sector, especially in the Amazon that is profiting from deforestation and other groups, and evangelicals. I think that under Bolsonaro, despite the problems of the government, these groups have become emboldened um, and are ready to act as Frankensteins. Um, I'm wondering, is Lula or any president now prepared to govern this new Brazil with these groups? What, what, what should we expect? So the military uh, corporate interest that is uh, uh, opposed to regulations and especially with an environmental concern and socially conservative uh, religious actors. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think, Nara? Um, I mean, I think this is uh, like this aspect that you were bringing up is the most interesting thing about Brazilian politics recently, the, this, uh, this kind of uh, rise of the far right movement. And it's interesting because at the beginning, it, it, it surprised people, right, to see that uh, like a, a right wing, a strong right wing movement in, in Brazil. Uh, and it's, it's also uh, interesting because um, the Brazilian population is conservative, so voters are are, are uh, more conservative than they are progressive, right? So they are located more towards the right, and I think the fact that they were the the uh, that elect um, that uh, voters were um, more conservative. Uh, helped this movement to get stronger and to even though I don't think most of Bolsonaro supporters are extremists, some are, and it's a small proportion, but um, I think it the fact that we have a population that is uh, more, that leans towards the right, uh, um, helped, right, this, this movement, and for the first time we had a popular, uh, openly right uh, uh, politician, right? Bolsonaro, he talks about it all the time. He's very proud of being right, uh, from the right. And this is different from what we had before, right? The idea of this abashed right or this uh, uh, right wing politicians that would be ashamed of being associated with the dictatorship or being associated with neoliberal uh, um, reforms in Brazil. So I think this is fascinating. And uh, I think the the it's it's really hard to to deal with that because again that reflects what the population is right and and, and the the position of the population in the ideological spectrum and what Bolsonaro did was to raise the salience of ideology in Brazil which was not it wasn't salient before people didn't think in in ideological terms they still don't think about it because it requires a lot of sophistication to do so but uh, I think people are more conscious of the right and the left and and some people are you know clearly against the left and identifying strongly with the right and in the past lula had again i mean he was very successful in um dealing with these different cleavages in in society but again these cleavages were not politicized they were not salient before so i think it's a big challenge that he has and i think it's going to also disappoint uh, left-wing voters, right? Because Lula is not going to be able to to please uh, and to respond to the demands of of the of the uh, sector of voters that are supporting him now in 2022. Okay, thank you, Nara. Uh, Bob, over to you. Um, we do have a question related to this one from Mariana Llanos. Um, as, you know, let's not forget to talk about the military uh, in particular as an institution. If you care to talk about it, or more generally. Um, Bob, um, the mic is yours. Yeah, so I was I was thinking about the United States, you know, so Trump uh -huh. calls himself the Trump, or Bolsonaro is the Trump of the tropics. And I think there, there's a lot to that parallel, uh, including um, Bolsonaro out of power. Uh, so everybody breathed a sigh of relief, rightly so, when Biden de defeated Trump uh, in 2020. Uh, but we soon discovered that the drama was not over uh, and uh, that polarization between parties has continued to poison the atmosphere. Uh, uh, and I'm afraid, I mean, to your, your comment, Javier, your question, 
that uh, life uh, will, will not be over, that the life of polarization will not be over by any means uh, in the October election either. Uh, and that what we're going to see is a scenario playing out that looks, um, you know, not identical to the United States, of course, but uh, uh, comparable to the United States, which is an anti-democratic, uh, profoundly disruptive opposition uh, that will contribute, first of all, I think, to a stalemate, make it more difficult to govern. Uh, but secondly, uh, an opposition which, going back to an earlier point, kind of poisons the the well for everyone because when you have that kind of anti-democratic opposition, it creates incentives on the other side to behave in illiberal, unconstitutional ways. And so I don't think we, However, the October election turns out, and my expectation is it'll turn out with a little uh, victory. Um, the the drama that we've seen unleashed uh, during the Bolsonaro period is not going to not going to end, unfortunately. Um, if I may go back to the military, simply because we have a follow up question from Bill Smith. Um, uh, let's imagine that there it might be an electoral crisis um, or some confrontation of some sort. Uh, a lot of people are saying, okay, the military may not carry out a coup, an old fashioned coup, but they may still do something. <laughs> uh, what could they do? How might they assert themselves in a sort of like camouflage way to uh, if they must, uh, uh, what should we expect? Uh, uh, are, uh, is the military unified, divided? Uh, are they thinking about this? A uh, bit of an update on uh, current military thinking uh, in Brazil as we uh, approach the election. Nar, do you wanna? <laughs> Sorry, I think you're muted, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know much about the details in terms of the politics uh, of the military, but uh, what I know is that the group is divided. Uh, and the military was a group that was key for Bolsonaro's election in 2018. And uh, basically it's, it's changed drastically, right? Some some important uh, uh, people of the military left to his government. And basically uh, I see that the strong uh, and the most powerful people of the military are not with Bolsonaro now. So I, 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 I have a hard time, um, you know, tr imagining that they could do something really effective in terms of supporting a coup or even maintaining it indirectly. Or I think it would be a, a huge failure, like in my, in my view, you know, if Bolsonaro yeah. tried something like that. I don't think the, the military would be unified enough to back him up or... Why, why has he lost part of the military? Um, Basically, I mean, he tried to, to keep this actor within his coalition and you're telling us that he wasn't successful. What, what went wrong? I mean, many different things, right? He lost, basically he lost um, the three main groups that supported him. And that's why he's now with the same throne. The, 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 those political parties that, you know, are not ideological and they are basically part of every single government and they are essential for maintaining uh, the the exchanges, right, that help to, to, ma to maintain the coalition. Bolsonaro was elected with this ideological uh, group, right, that was this far right and right wing uh, um, people, uh, um, the Lava Jatistas, right, people who were part of Lava Jato and the military. And basically, uh, because of so many corruption scandals, uh, the military was really, the military enjoys a very, uh, 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 Good reputation in Brazil is historically. So they also don't want to get associated or involved with a government that uh, is controversial and that it's involved in corruption. And uh, the military and, and basically Bolsonaro at some point he was, you know, he wasn't able to govern and he needed to kind of leave some of his core supporters behind or aside to be able to uh, govern and to pass legislation in Congress and to kind of govern as any other uh, uh, president governed in Brazil. 
Brazil so far. Interesting, um, um, Bob, um, because you have been doing comparisons with the United States. Um, if you had to compare Bolsonaro with Trump in terms of maintaining their initial electoral coalitions, which of the two presidents you think would you say um, uh, has been more successful in, in, in keeping the base coherent, if, if, if you have any thoughts on that? Well, we, we haven't seen Bolsonaro out of power yet, so hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's hard to speculate that I, I, on that. I would say, though, that the structure of the American party system is such that when you capture one of the major parties, which is what Trump has done effectively, um, you're far more dangerous uh, than if you have to use your personal appeal to um, to wield together a, a coalition that's not united in a single party. So in direct answer to your question, I think that Trump is probably more dangerous uh, than for that reason than Bolsonaro. Fascinating. Um, okay, um, I have a question from Scott Morgenstern who would like to hear more about the evangelicals um, and specifically uh, both um, what happened to the evangelical vote under Bolsonaro and of course, uh, if we get a Lula government, another Lula government, how is he going to interact with evangelicals? Uh, my understanding is that uh, during his uh, first two administrations, Lula had a good relationship with evangelicals, but that's many, many years ago. Um, so what's in store uh, with uh, what happened to evangelicals under Bolsonaro and what is going to happen with evangelicals under Lula if we get the Lula presidency? Nara? The, the PT lost the evangelical vote during Dilma's government, and uh, basically Bolsonaro uh, was very successful in kind of um, getting that vote in 2018, but in also maintaining it right throughout his his term. So he's super strong among ev evangelicals. What Lula is trying to do is to kind of recover some of his contacts, uh, and he's now with Silas Malafaia, a very popular um, pastor that helped him. Uh, um, when he was in power and he's now trying to help um, you know him regain his popularity among ev evangelicals and well Lula is uh, he's it's interesting to see not only Lula but also politicians in Brazil kind of trying to play the religion game in Brazil because they understand that it's super important and so Marcelo Freixo for instance who is a uh, left-wing politician who is running for governor in Rio he has recently you know started like trying to uh, get the evangelical vote to and in Rio this is like super important and essential so what Lula is trying to do is to basically um, have this kind of uh, religious discourse and to basically say that if, uh, that Bolsonaro he's not religious and what he says what he does uh, and it's not you know um, it couldn't be associated with somebody who is religious or you know who uh, praise God or so and he's also trying to gain the evangelical uh, vote among women so Bolsonaro, he has, you know, women reject Bolsonaro a lot in, in, in Brazil. His rejection rates are super high among women. And so Lula is really trying to court that, that sector of the evangelicals, uh, evangelical women. Because evangelical women see in Lula what? Uh, uh, um, because they're cross-pressured, right? They are evangelicals, but they're also more left-wing. Um, uh, women in Brazil they are more left-wing than than men, and they are more. Uh, Lula has a, a, has a more limited rejection rates among women too. So there is this uh, kind of uh, gender division that started playing out in 2018 in Brazil, and something that we didn't see uh, in the three past elections. But in 2018, we saw it, and we see it now, right? A huge. So women are more. They are. Um, they haven't decided their vote at a higher rate than men, and they're more um, they're against Bolsonaro too uh, at a higher rate than than men. So Lula is really trying to to kind of uh, uh, play that and, and, and to to focus on this sector of the electorate, which is cross pressure, right? And they're less um, they reject Lula less, and they're more willing to vote for him too. So that's kind of his his uh, campaign strategy. 
and it's working. It is working. Um, this is uh, amazing. I mean, I, I, I am very fascinated to hear about the fact that in Brazil, there might be a gender divide within the evangelical bloc. Uh, yeah. um, it, it's not talked about that much elsewhere. So, so yeah. uh, let's see whether, how, how and, big and of a divide there is, gender divide, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting to see how this gender division uh, increased during the, the pandemic too, right? So that's when we see oh. women also different, like being, you know, uh, the, the the kind of the voting tension and the political behavior of women changing um, from, mm -hmm. from the Nara, and do you know when you say that women evangelicals are a little bit more progressive, do you also mean in terms of social issues and issues of sexuality and LGBTQ rights as well, or do they stop there? Are they more progressive in terms of uh, seeing uh, a larger welfare state, um, more human yeah. rights policies? Yeah, with, with, yeah, that yeah. too. And, inter and also in terms of the salience of these issues, right? Certain issues, it's not uh -huh. to say that uh, women are more or less progressive or conservative than, than, than men, but they care less about that issue than men. Uh, and they are more you know, worried about yeah, social policies, and and they were they were more uh, probably uh, unhappy about the way Bolsonaro dealt with the pandemic in Brazil and things like that. So it's also it's a matter of position, but also a matter of salience of these issues. Okay, Bob, I don't know if you want to say something about religion. I am curious about your current thoughts on the role of religion and democratic backsliding, whether in reference to Brazil or the United States or in general, uh, um, um, uh, uh, do you have anything to-, to I'm not to sure, I thought, that, I thought this was very, this is stuff I didn't know, so I'm, uh, that now I was talking about, so I'm glad to, I'm glad to, to learn. Um, I think that what's clear about the general pattern of backsliding is that um, cultural issues are really the spur of polarization and the the spur to the you know to, to backsliding. Um, class plays some role. It certainly played some role in in other Latin American countries, uh, but I think more and more, if you look at both Latin America and um, uh, and Eastern Europe in particular. Um, it's really the it's really cultural issues broadly defined, and that would include religion, but it would also include ethnicity. It would also include um, uh, LGBT you know, issues surrounding LGBT rights. Um, it would include uh, 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 rejection of immigrants. Uh, uh, all of these are really not economic issues, they're cultural issues. So they've become increasingly important, that seems to me. Right, and, and the, 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 one of the ramifications of that insight is that it becomes very hard for, um, for politicians to talk about public policy in the sense of addressing public policy issues when the voters are thinking about cultural issues that are harder to address with public policy. That's um, my feeling of why it's so difficult to contain it because some of the tools available to, to deal with this content, mostly addressing public policy issues are not gonna work in these cultural uh, environments. Yeah, I think you're right, uh, Javier, but I also think it's worth bearing in mind that this is a top down as well as a bottom up phenomenon and so yeah uh, the divisions uh certainly uh, uh come from the bottom up and, and felt needs and felt positions of the electorate uh but they're stirred up uh in major ways by politicians who um you know profit from that so um, a corollary potentially to that although we it's not tested in the real world is that somebody who comes along and makes a, a realistic and persuasive appeal to uh, economic interests uh, can make a big difference. And then actually, the, what Nara was saying about the evangelicals in Brazil uh, gives some support to that. You know, that, that Lula is winning back evangelicals by making an economic appeal. Um, or at least in part. So 
Um, I, right. I, I don't think we should let the politicians off the hook. I think that they, I think that they contribute to it. Right, and you know, um, there's an element of competence in public office, and that's one of uh, Bolsonaro's uh, negative points. This is not a competent administration, regardless of ideology, and um, and you can run against. Uh, Bolsonaro-style uh, Bolsonaro style candidates by uh, appealing to the need for competent public policy and, and good administration. Um, okay, I, I, I absolutely take your point. So um, let me um, thank you very much for discussing. And again, I wanna keep inviting people to submit questions. I do have um, a few more topics to discuss regarding the election, if I may. Um, uh, and this is something that perhaps Nara, you may be more familiar with. So let me, I'm gonna turn to you. So we're living in the post-truth world. I think it's um, uh, unimaginable for us to, in, to, to think that eventually we're gonna be free of fake news. This is now part of it. Um, <clears throat> uh, WhatsApp and fake news was a big issue in Bolsonaro's um, election um, um, four years ago. Where are we on fake news, WhatsApp groups, trolling? What's happening? Tell us you're in Brazil. Uh, 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 what is, what, wh where are we uh, on this question in Brazil? Is it uh, any updates that you may have for us? I mean, I think in 2018, everybody was caught by surprise, right? With a discussion on fake news. And it was one of the main issues in 2018 was fake news and particular fake news, uh, talking about cultural issues and values and things like that. And, uh, and basically the campaigns in Brazil are, um, they happen um, in, in kind of uh, instant messaging apps, right? More in Brazil than in other parts of the world. The world. So Brazil and India are kind of the uh, um, two countries in which campaigns are really heavily conducted in this um, um, form, and it's really hard to control the content that circulates in this in these apps, right? Because they're not public. So um, in 2018, institutions couldn't do much about fake news, right? They they were caught by surprise. There was you know it was very controversial, but I feel that. Um, now institutions are more well prepared to deal with this issue and they are trying to combat fake news. They, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, is fighting against Bolsonaro constantly and against fake news and trying to combat this, this issue. But at the same time, I think we know very little about fake news and misinformation. And it's interesting because when you started your question, you talked about this uh, post-truth era, right? And people who are studying fake news in the US or misinformation, they're saying that this concern is exaggerated, that we shouldn't be too concerned about it because actually studies weren't able to find drastic effects of fake news. It's basically, it's this idea that, for instance, campaigns don't matter much, they don't persuade people, and fake news also do not persuade, uh, does not persuade people. Um, but I, you know, I did two recent studies that one showing that conspiracy theories in Brazil reduce um, um, support for democracy. And so being exposed to uh, conspiracy theories about politics make people less willing to support democracy. And, and the dimension of democracy that is more affected is the one that is related to electoral integrity, uh, which says a lot about, you know, current politics in Brazil. And we also find that in you know, a different research, we find that fake news mobilize voters more, right? So it's not about persuasion, it's about mobilization. And I think um, this is definitely concerning, right? I think fake news, they do have the power, uh, fake news uh, has the power to change the course of politics. Uh, and at least is, in contexts like, like Brazil. Is mobilization a uh, euphemism for perhaps radicalization of the electorate? No, it's more, it makes, so being exposed to fake news, either yeah. fake news or hyper-partisan content, right? That's not yeah. fake. We have, we have these two different categories. Uh, they're similar, but different, right? Because fake news is too similar to hyper-partisan news, but it's fake. Um, uh -huh. so, uh, what we find is that it makes people more, so fake, fake news uh, against 
the, the Workers' Party, for instance, negative news about the Workers' Party or about Lula make uh, makes people more willing to campaign for Bolsonaro in support of Bolsonaro. So, and this is what we've been seeing. I mean, because the content of misinformation is always inflammatory. It's, you know, it, demon, it demonizes the out group, it demonizes politics and political actors. So it's making people more willing to engage in uh, campaign related uh, activities. I think one last question is because we have two minutes. So you each get 45 seconds. If Bolsonaro loses and if he doesn't accept the results of the elections, then what? 45 seconds. <laughs> Do you think that that's still possible, uh, not accepting the, the results? Yeah. I mean, he says that all the time. He says that he's not going to, yeah, like, he's, he's, he's going to wait to see what happens. He's, he's not going to commit to accepting the the results of the elections. I think it's not going to, I think, again, I mean, he might do something similar to what happened in the U.S., which might be more damaging in, a, in the context of Brazil than it was in the context of the U.S., but I don't think it's going to be uh, something that will change the political regime in Brazil. Again, it's going to be damaging, and it's going to cause a lot of trouble in Brazil, and in, even more instability but I don't think it's going to go too far. Bob? I basically agree. I, I worry about, uh, a, I don't think the transfer of power, I think there will be a transfer of power. I don't think it will be peaceful. Um, uh, I'm guessing that there will be January 26 type uh, uh, insurrections of, at various points. Um, at the end of the day, I guess that I do expect the winner to be able to take office, uh, but that that leaves a scar, and um, so you know there's trouble ahead. Well, let's end right here. I want to before we uh, leave, I want to announce that the Charlemos team has another Charlemos event planned for November 14th. This is going to be entitled, you have a, a, the, the flyer there, Public Responses to Undemocratic Incumbents, very related to today's subject. And we're gonna have Matt, Matthew Singer from UConn and Amy Erica Smith from Iowa State uh, um, as our guests. And this is going to be hosted by um, Andres Mejia Costa. Great, so Nara, Bob, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for your writing and, and for uh, uh, illuminating us on all these uh, really complicated questions for such an important country as Brazil. All of us who joined us, thank you so much for supporting Charlemos. All of these uh, 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 Charlemos events are recorded. They're wonderful teaching tools. Uh, make sure that you visit the Charlemos website uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. We now have almost two years uh, of talks, uh, all by um, uh, top scholars and analysts. So thank you for supporting it. Hope to see you back at a future Charlemos. Goodbye, everyone. Our thoughts on uh, those who are joining from Tampa, Florida, if you have any power. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Is there a postmortem, or are we saying? <laughs> <laughs>